Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to be here, Lord, and to be amongst your people, Lord, and to, to open your word together, to hear from you. And, and Father, I pray that you would uh, give help this morning, that you would send your spirit, Lord, help me to, Lord, to deliver the message to this body here, Lord, that you would have, Lord, give us ears to hear, Lord, and just pray that Christ would be exalted, Lord, and that, um, Lord, that we would see things from your perspective as they really are, Lord, just pray that you would bless us this morning with your presence, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I wanted to talk to you today about the church, and uh, for the men that were at the men's retreat, some of this will sound fairly familiar, um, but it's not going to be a, a copy by any means. It's actually something I've been going over on Tuesday nights back in Corpus, um, just kind of stumbled into a, a short series of sorts about the, the church and, and being a member of the church. Um, so before, before I get into it, let me ask you, the, the title for this is, What is the Church? So let me ask you that question, what is the church? And there's multiple right answers. Um, so I'm not looking for any one particular answer, but what is the church? Body of believers? Body of believers. Bride of Christ? Body of Christ with Christ as the head? So far, so good. Bride? Yeah. Made up of the invisible and visible church. Made up of visible and invisible. What's an invisible church? Are there people here we don't see? <laughs> the term. <laughs> the worldwide church. Yeah. The the church at large. And that that's good. I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up because I'm going to be talking about what scripture talks about the vast majority of the time when it talks about the church. It's talking about the local church. So it's talking about what I'm going to talk to you about this morning is you. Right? It's the local church. The majority of the time in scripture, when the scripture talks about the church, it's a local church. And even when you have uh, letters like Galatians that were written to several churches within a region, they were to read it written to them, the local church, whichever one it was that read it. Um, what else? Think, think about it for a minute. There's other, other things the church is defined as. called out ones, yeah, and now we're getting more into the, the definition. Um, if you don't know, church is not a translation of a Greek word. It's a transliteration. So if, they, if we were to translate the Greek word ekklesia, um, what would we, what are some things that it could be translated as? If you know, think about things that Israel was referred to in the Old Testament. No, they were chosen, but that's that's not the word. Congregation, assembly. Um, so the word itself is called out ones, but it's more specific than that. It's the idea of calling people out of their homes to assemble together for a purpose. 
It's a lot of times it's referred to just as called out ones, but but it's called to assemble and it's for a purpose. So if you had like a, a town hall or a town meeting, you might have someone in the town square ringing a bell, calling out all the town to come together and to assemble together and to meet together. Um, that's that's the, the word itself, uh, ecclesia, uh, that is transliterated church, and I won't get into that because it really doesn't matter. When I say church, we know, we know what we're talking about. There's a couple other things the, the church is referred to. Let's just, let's just jump in and, and look at it. Open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is basically rebuking the church at Corinth for the divisions that they have among them. Um, Some people are saying, well, we follow Paul, we follow Apollos, we follow Peter. Well, the really spiritual ones follow Christ. Um, And he's rebuking them for that, and he tells them that as long as they're acting like that, he has to talk to them as though they're merely men, carnal, um, as though they don't know any spiritual truth. And he's talking about who Paul is and who Apollos is in chapter 3. And let's just pick it up in verse 5. Who then is Apollos, and what is Paul? servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. Now, what does it sound like? Don't look ahead. What does it sound like he's describing the church as? A plant. Yeah. Planting, watering, growing. So he's referring to the church as as a plant. Verse 7, so then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So remember, he's talking about him and Apollos, those that are church planters, those that are missionaries, those that are out proclaiming Christ and people are being saved and, and the church is being being formed. That's what he's, that's what he's talking about. Uh, the one who plants, the one who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, Paul and Apollos, the, these apostles, missionaries. Uh, you are God's field. And then he changes metaphors there, and we'll come back to that later. But I want us to see that the church is referred to as as a plant. Uh, we think about the parable of the of the sower. It's Christ. It's the it's the Son of Man that he goes about scattering seed, and some seed germinates and springs up, and it seems like there's life. And with others, that doesn't even happen because the seed falls on the wayside. The gospel is proclaimed to people that just don't receive it. No effect. Nothing at all. And there's two other types of people that they receive the word at first, and it seems like the Lord is doing something. It seems like there's life, the the seed that falls on the stony ground and the thorny ground, except either persecution or just life in general happens and chokes out the gospel so that there is no fruit produced, and they eventually fall away, turn away. But then there's that good ground where the plant springs up and it bears fruit. It's fruitful. And, and those are the ones that, that are truly converted, trusting in Christ. Um, turn over to John 15. This will be very familiar for the men that were at the, at the retreat. In 
in John 15. Let's just read 1 through 6. I am the true vine, Jesus speaking. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes or he lifts it up so that it may bear more fruit. You're already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Now he prunes it. I'm, I'm reading out of the NAS. In verse 2, it says he prunes it that it may bear more fruit. The, the word is actually clean. He cleans it so that it may bear more fruit. And then verse 3, he says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. The, it's, it's, he's talking about pruning. It's, it's cleaning branches, which means pruning them to do away with the, the growth that's not going to bear fruit anymore so that there can be new, gro- new growth and fruit will be produced. Abide in me, verse 4, and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. So here, again, he's talking about Christ himself being the vine, and and we, disciples, Christians, members of the church, those who are in Christ, abiding in him, his word is abiding in us, we're a part of him, we're a part of that plant, which here is pictured as Christ. Well, as we'll see as we go on, this is a picture of the church, those who are disciples, members of a church are disciples of Christ. They are a part of Christ. When we get to looking at the body, we'll see Christ is the head and the body is made up of different members. This, this here speaks of our, our oneness with Christ. We're united with him, inseparable. If you cut a branch off of the vine, what does it say happens to him? They wither up and die. They're thrown into the fire. They're no good. We can't do anything apart from Christ. And one of the places I'm going this morning, which I really hope to get to even much, much more in the sermon, this is kind of a two-part thing, is we're all part of one another because of our union with him. So that we may be different branches, different pieces, different people, but we are all part of the whole. We're part of that plant of the church. We're members of one another. What, I mean, you think about a plant. A, a plant grows, any type of plant, not just a vine, a tree, whatever. It, it puts out branches or shoots, leaves. And what happens? What do those leaves do that are part of the plant? Who knows something about biology? No? Yeah, photosynthesis. So I can't tell you. I'm, I'm, I can't get into the details of it. But, but they take in the, the, the sunlight and it provides life for the rest of the plant. It, it actually goes down and nourishes the roots and in turn the, 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 the roots draw water up and it spreads into the whole plant. There is a union within the plant. If you strip, if you strip the leaves off of a plant, depending on what type of plant it is, there's a very good chance it will die. Now some plants do good with pruning Right? And that's the, the vine here Jesus is talking about, the, the grape vine, I believe is what he has in mind. And, and they get pruned back, and that's how they bear fruit. A grape, a grape vine doesn't bear much fruit unless it's pruned, because it's actually the new growth that produces an abundance of fruit. 
And the picture of it here is, is the vine dresser, our father, pruning the vine, pruning the branches. He doesn't go prune one branch. He prunes the whole thing. I mean, if we, if we think about that individually, there's things in my life that keep me from being as fruitful as I could be. And because the Father loves me, He's going to clean me. He's going to prune me. And as, as we grow, as we mature in the Lord, there's going to be some things falling away in our life. Well, it's absolutely no different with the church, with the local church. He prunes the vine. He prunes churches. And some things fall away, whether it's people, whether it's the way you've done things before, uh, whether it's practices, things, traditions, whatever, that, that are actually keeping you from being more fruitful, any number of things. Well, he tends us. The Father tends the church so that it will become fruitful. Whenever there's, I can't remember where it is. There's somewhere up northwest of San Antonio, a place that we drive by when we, whenever we go to Abilene. Um, I think that's where it is. Anyway, there's a, a vineyard that's there. There's a, like a local winery where they grow their own grapes and, and all that. And if you, if you drive by there in the, in the springtime, summertime, they've got the trellises out there and they're just covered in vines, just lush and green and, and all that. If you come by in the fall after they've gone through and pruned them, they look dead doesn't matter, year after year, if you drive by them after they've been pruned, there's, there's this big stalk coming up and some big major vines that branch out, but the foliage is gone, the branches are gone, those, those smaller ones. And it looks like, wow, what happened? Did they get mad at the branches and just go hack them to pieces? Are you trying to kill them? No. He's tending them and caring for them so that in the springtime, when the springtime comes, they flush out and they bear much fruit. That's how it is with, with us and with Christ. Abiding in Him, He's going to, the, the Father is going to clean us. We read about it in Hebrews, the discipline of the Lord. The reason that He disciplines us is so that we will be fruitful. It's not just correction. It's not just, okay, well, you're sinned and the Father's going to come spank you. That's not, if that's your only view of discipline, you're not understanding it correctly. It's teaching, training, instruction, correction, not just because you've erred, but there's a better way to go, a better way to do things. The Lord does this with, with a church as well. If this church is the same 10 years from now as it is right now, today, something's wrong. There should be some differences. There some be, should be different people. Some people added, some people gone maybe. Maybe you're not doing things exactly the same way. Maybe your meetings aren't the same way now. I, again, any number of things. But when you find those churches that we've been doing this for 30 years, we're not about to change today, Guess what? They don't have a vine dresser. They don't have anyone to prune them. They don't have anyone to mature them and grow them so that they become more fruitful. And again, I'm not, I'm not suggesting y'all make changes. That's not the point. The point is that the Father is the vine dresser of the church and His work in the church is that it bears more fruit. And sometimes it's not visible. But his working is always for the production of more fruit. And that doesn't mean more people. It might mean more holiness. It might mean fewer people who are really united into the vine, united with Christ, 
seeking his will, loving him, loving the brethren, and desiring to stir one another up to love and good deeds. It might mean adding more people in. That will do those same things because that's, as we'll see, that's what it means to be a part of the church. Members of the church exist for one another. That, that's why you should be coming to the church is for others, for those around you. But let's look at another, another thing. I don't even know. Is that how many, how long I've gone or how long I have left? I guess it's how long I've gone. Let's stay right here or go back to 1 Corinthians 3. First Corinthians three, and let's pick up where we left off in verse nine. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. Now what is the building again? It's the church. It's the apostle. What he's talking about specifically is the apostles' work in, in building churches. They're laying a foundation. What's the foundation? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's Christ. Verse 11, no other man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. Now, I'm not going to get into this and argue this point, but if you follow who the builder, who the laborers are, it's not you. It's the apostles. They're the ones building. You're the, you're the as we'll see, the, the stone or gold or silver or wood, hay or stubble that they're building with. That's the members of the church. The builders are the apostles. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, verse 14, he will receive a reward. So, I mean, again, just briefly, this isn't you standing before Christ in the day of judgment. This is the apostles building the church and the church being tested and their work, which is the church being tested. And then they will receive a reward whether or not the church stands up to the testing. If any man's work is burned up, the work is the church. He will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved as through fire. So the one being saved here is not it's not the church, it's not the individuals, it's talking about the one building. If he's laboring with the gospel, do you not know, verse 16, do you not know that you are God's temple and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? The, the NAS says you are a temple of God. I, I, I like the way that several other translations uh, refer to it. You are God's temple. Um, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. So we are, the church is referred to as a building. And the building that it's referring to is the temple. Um, now, this is the fulfillment. The, understand this. The church is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy of the church, or of rather the temple being rebuilt again. That, that's, that's church. That's the church. It's the people of God. The dispensationalists are looking for a physical stone building to be rebuilt in Jerusalem, in Israel, and sacrifices to be set up again and, and instituted again in Israel sacrifices, burnt offering, sin offering, offering for atonement, 
guilt offering, all the various offerings. Where was that? Who fulfilled all those things? It's Christ. We don't go back to shadows when the substance is here. It would actually be blasphemous to offer an animal as a sacrifice for sin. That would be blasphemy against the God who gave his son, who is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, who all those, those sacrifices were pointing to. The, our Passover has been sacrificed. The offering for sin has been sacrificed. The burnt offering has been made. It's Christ. There's no room for any other sacrifices. That's the warning in Hebrews. Don't go back and do again the things you did before and trample underfoot the Son of God. Don't count the blood of the covenant as an unclean thing, a common thing, like the blood of bulls and goats and animals. In Ephesians chapter 2, Look at a, just a few verses here. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. He says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Now, in Ephesians, what he's dealing with here is reconciling the tension between Jews and Gentiles. That's so much of the New Testament deals with the, the tension in the church between Jewish believers and Gentile believers. And that was huge in the early church, in the apostolic church. You're not reading your New Testament correctly if you're not reading it with that in mind. It will make a big difference in the way you understand the scriptures to read it like the early church read it where he's not talking about you right here he's talking about gentiles those who were without god who didn't have the promises didn't have the covenants pagans aliens and all that and now they've been united with christ they've trusted in christ and israel who had all these things, they had the covenants, they had the oracles of God, they had Moses, they had the law, they had the prophets, they had the fathers, they had all of these things. And the Gentiles who were once pagan, we kill them, we don't invite them over for dinner, we destroy them. Now they're being brought in and you call them brother and you accept them in and they are one with you. And you both serve the same Lord, the same Christ. Oh yeah, you're Jewish Messiah, He's the Messiah of the world. That's what was going on, and that was the tension that was there. You think there's trouble in the church today. They would laugh at us that we had racial tensions in the church. They, they, would, they would shame us. They would say, what is wrong with you? Do you know what we had to deal with? Thousands of years of tradition going from the, the worship and the service of the one true God and something happened, that covenant came to an end, and now there's a new covenant, it would be just like someone walking up here and standing up in here and saying, hey, guess what? The Messiah is here. He's over in Washington or, or some, some other place. The Messiah, and you'd be going, what are you talking about? No, 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 we've got the Word of God. This is what the Word of God says. I mean, yeah, I, I, I know that scripture prophesies of who the messiah would be i'm saying that's the kind of shock that they would have when all of a sudden here is the messiah and yeah he was a carpenter in nazareth he wasn't educated he didn't he didn't rise up as a political leader to free us from our oppressors our occupiers yeah he actually died what what are you talking about it's that kind of shock and disbelief and, and not being able to get their heads around it that was going on in the early church between the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers. When you read about people observing days and not observing days and, and eating things and not eating things and eating meat offered to idols, and, and that's all that tension. 
of Jews and Gentiles. When you read the book of Romans and you read about justification by faith and not by works of law, all that is directed to the Jewish believers. It profits the Gentile hearers also, but it's directly to, look, you Jews are on the same ground as the Gentiles. There is no salvation in the law. You're on the same ground. All have sinned. All, Jew and Gentile alike, fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death for everyone. That's what's going on in Ephesians 2. You got these two people and Paul saying, you're not two people. You're one. That's, I, I rambled on a little bit, but that's, what it, that's what's at stake here. That's the context of what he's writing about here. So Ephesians 2, 19. So you are no longer strangers and aliens, Gentiles, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, the family of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together in a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Jesus isn't the foundation. Jesus is the cornerstone. The foundation is the good news about Jesus. The, good, the, the foundation is the gospel. It's the teaching of the apostles. Christ himself, the person, the man Christ Jesus, is the cornerstone. Now, we don't know much about cornerstones today in building it would be like saying that uh, Jesus is the, the, the transom and, and the marker for the elevation. He's the reference point. The cornerstone was the most important stone that, that they would use on a building. The, 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 the laborers would spend a lot of time making sure that that cornerstone, which is just that, it would be on the corner of a building, it would be set in the corner of the building. They would take a lot of pains and time making sure that that stone was set up true, perfectly at a 90 degrees, perfectly plumb, perfectly level. It was set just right because that set the course for the rest of the building. And that would be the reference point that the rest of the building would be built off of so that they can measure however far this way and however far that way they need to go and set cornerstones again, square everything up. That was the reference point. Christ is the reference point of the church. The whole building is set on him and laid out on him. We're the, the temple of God. Now I want to think about a couple, couple things here. What was the temple? It's the place where God dwelled among his people. Think about the tabernacle in the wilderness. Think about Solomon's temple when he built the temple. And it was inaugurated and it was, it was set up. What happened? The presence of God came down. God came down and filled the temple so that the priests couldn't even go into the temple because of the presence of God. Fire came down, consumed all the offering that was there. The glory of God filled the temple. Think about, think about the Old Testament at the, at the bottom of the Mount Sinai there when God came down in the midst of his people. He came down on the mountain, the presence of God that was there. And then the tabernacle was built and the same thing God came down into the tabernacle, the presence of God in the tabernacle. Don't you know that you are the temple of God? That's, that's, that's the significance of what Paul said back in 1 Corinthians. Do you know? Do you recognize? You're the dwelling place of God in this world. Not you, and I could start calling names or pointing at people. It's not so much you individually 
It's you, church. What are you individually? Peter says you're a living stone. You're a stone. Look at the walls. What's it made up of? Cinder blocks. Individual stones. That's not it. It's the building. And, and we know this is not the church. You are the church. This isn't the temple. You're the temple. But there's something to be learned from this. I can go over there and I can knock a block out of that wall. What's going to happen to the building? Nothing. Nothing's going to happen to the building. You're going to lose some AC. That wall's not coming down. I could knock several blocks out of there. Walls are not coming down. Why? Why not? How come if I go knock a hole in there, the rest of the wall is going to stay? Because the blocks that are left support each other. And they keep one another from falling down. That's what your responsibility as a member of this church is. Do not walk in those doors and come into this congregation and sit down to receive. Come to hold up the others around you. That's our responsibility as members of Christ is to do Christ's work. And Christ doesn't come into this church and sit in the pew to receive. He sends His Spirit to come and to teach and to convict and to instruct and to encourage and to build up and to edify. He's working. We're members of Him. We're part of His body. We're His temple. This is His dwelling place where He resides. Again, not this building. I, I, y'all don't have to do what, what I do. I'm very careful that I don't call our meeting place the church. I slip sometimes and I'll, I'll call it. But I try to be very intentional. The building at, at 230, 2339 Agnes is not the church. That's the meeting place for the church. And I try to remind myself and also to remind others that's not the church. That's where the church meets. We're the temple of God. Turn to Psalm 84. Listen to this with, with what we've been reading, what I've been saying in mind. Who, what's the temple? What's the temple? What is it? The church. The temple is the church. 1 Corinthians 3, you, or let, let's put it in the right vernacular, y'all are the temple. It's not you singular. It's plural. You all. Y'all are the temple. You individually are a stone in that temple. The place where God dwells. By the way, what was Christ called? Emmanuel, which means think about the Old Testament. Think about the presence of God coming down on the mountain, coming down in the bush, coming down in the tabernacle, in the temple, the presence of God. That's nothing. As a matter of fact, Paul says, because of the glory of the new covenant, that covenant is though it had no glory. We don't think about things like that. We so need to think about things the right way. We need to get our eyes off of the physical realm, off of this realm, and into the heavenly realm, fixing our eyes above. It's not up there. It's the place where Christ is. 
It's not a location. It's the kingdom. And we're in the kingdom. And God dwells in us and among us. In you individually, yes, but the purpose for that is for the building. It's for the temple as the whole. It's for the church as a whole. The church as a whole is the greatest representation of Christ on this world. And I'm, again, I'm speaking locally because the people out there, the people you work with, your family members, they don't see the universal church. They don't see the church. They see you as a part of this body in this city. Let's read Ephesians, or I'm sorry, Psalm 84. How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. How lovely is your church, O Lord of hosts. My soul longed and even yearned for the church of the Lord for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. The bird also has found a house and the swallow a nest for herself where she lay her young. Even in your church, O Lord of hosts, even at your altars, my King and my God, how blessed are those who dwell in your church. They are ever praising you. How blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to the church. What's the church? It's the city of God, or rather, what's Zion? Zion is the city of the king. It's the place where the king lives. It's the city where the king lives. Think about Revelation. Seeing the, the new Jerusalem descending out of heaven. It's not a building, it's the church. It's descriptive language. It's apocalyptic language. Just like the beasts aren't some type of beast, they're nations. The, the New Jerusalem, it's not a city, it's the church. It's the place where God dwells among His people. Passing through the valley of, of Baca, uh, weeping, they make it a spring. In the early rain, it, it covers it with blessings. Wherever God's people go, they bring, they bring blessings where there was weeping and sorrow. They go from strength to strength, and every one of them appear before God in Zion. O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. And look upon the face of your anointed, for a day in your courts, a day in your church, is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God. It's referring to the person that, that is the lowest servant in the place, and he stands at the, the doorway to wash people's feet when they come in. It's position of the lowest servant. I would rather be the lowest servant in the church of God than dwell in the palaces of wickedness, in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold, uh, withhold from those who walk uprightly. O oh Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. Have you read that? Did, I'm sure you've read that psalm before. Did it sound a little different this time, talking about what we've been talking about, what the church is? Did you stop thinking about it as the temple and start thinking about it as one another? How blessed it is to be part one another. How blessed it is for God's people to come together with each other. The place where God dwells. Well, I don't feel like he's here. Do you only pray when you feel like God hears? Or you pray in faith knowing that God hears? Do you come here? I was talking to someone uh, just this past week, actually. I had a really, really good point. You know, we go to the, go to the men's retreat, and 
man, you're expecting something. And there's always, it's always such a blessing. It just seems like the Lord gives, gives extra help to the, to the preachers that are there. We go to the fellowship conference and, man, you go expecting. You tell me, who's been to the fellowship conference at least once? Yeah. What are people always saying about the fellowship conference? Yeah, it's like a little taste of heaven on earth. Church, right here this morning, every single time you meet together, it's a taste of heaven on earth. Zero difference from the fellowship conference. Zero difference from the, from the men's retreat. You know what the difference is? Our expectation. We just don't really believe God's here. We don't really believe the Spirit of God is in this room this morning. We don't believe Christ is actually here. If we did, we would come expecting to hear from Him. Go back and listen to some of those messages. They're glorious messages. They're wonderful messages. But when you go back and listen to them, It's not quite as glorious as it was when you were there expecting to hear from God. I've been convicted about this. I've been really trying to press this with our church. Man, this, the the temple was central in the life of Israel because that's where God was. Now we know it's not the building. I just got through saying we are the temple. The church is the temple of God. But we need to believe that. We need to act like that. Man, you start thinking about things rightly and it's amazing how your life changes. It's amazing how your view and how much that changing one thing in your thinking can affect so many other things in your life. That's part of being, having the mind of the Spirit, having the mind of Christ. That's what truth does. It affects, it produces fruit. It starts bearing fruit in other places. We've got five minutes left for the next point. Y'all have already mentioned it, so we won't spend a lot of time there. 1 Corinthians 12, we're members of one body. Romans 12, 5, we're members of each other. The church is members of each other. In Ephesians, multiple places in Ephesians, members of one body, members of another, members of Christ. Colossians 1, 18 and 24, Christ is the head. Ephesians 5.23, Christ is the head. I don't know if I'll begin the message looking at the body or, or not. If you're walking down the sidewalk and you look down in the gutter and there's a hand, a man's hand laying in the gutter, Apart from being grossed out, what's wrong? You're going to be somewhat shocked, actually. Why? It's supposed to be attached to a body. It'd be be one thing to find, you know, someone laying in the gutter, a body laying in the gutter. If y'all have a homeless... uh, situation here like we do in Corpus that's actually not really uncommon to see people just laid out on the sidewalk and and things sleeping or on the benches but if you were to just see a hand sitting there on the at the bus stop on the bench something's wrong we're a part of the body and the reference is the body of Christ in other words we're members of Christ When you go to 1 Corinthians 12 and it's talking about the gifts, 
One of the big things there, 12, 13, and 14, the love chapter stuck right in the middle of of the section on gifts because of the, the necessity of the gifts to operate and function in love. One of the things you'll see there is Paul was concerned with the gifts that edify everyone. They edify the body. You speak in tongues, that's okay, that's well, that's good. You're edified, but others don't understand. What good does it do for the body? So I would rather you prophesy that the whole body might be edified. His emphasis is on the body as one body, seeing ourselves not as a whole, and this may sound, this may sound strange, but there is a sense in where you should think of yourself not as a member of Christ, but as a member of the church. Because it's no different. The church is the body of Christ. I'm not going off into heresy. I'm not losing priorities. I'm just using Bible language. The church is the body of Christ. So I should be very comfortable saying I am a member of the church. And synonymously, I'm a member of Christ. Because, I mean, I love the language in in John and Jesus' prayer that he is in the Father and the Father is in him and he is in us and we are in him. It's that union, it's that connection, it's that oneness, the joint together. What happens? What happens when you're walking along and boom, oh, you stub your toe? I forgot I had water in there. Your whole body reacts. Your hands reach down to to grab your toe. You bend at the waist. Your leg comes up. Your whole body reacts because you hit one member, stubbed one member. It affects the whole body. That's how close you should be, church. So that if one person's suffering, you all suffer with them. And if another rejoices, you all rejoice with them. If one person is need, you all give to the need. And I'm not saying you're not. I'm saying that's what you should be. If that's who you are, praise the Lord. Now do better. No complacency, no satisfaction, no look how good we are, how we've arrived. No, that's the... No, Paul says, you know, I didn't need to ride to tell you these things, but I'm going to tell you anyway. No one needs to tell you this because you're already doing it. But do better. Because we have not arrived to the measure of Christ yet. If what you've heard me saying is do, 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 then I hope I'll be, I'll correct that some in the message. Um, Because part of what we're going to look at in the message is Love, love, love. That, that's, that's how it's accomplished. Not by getting checklists out, oh, I need to do this and I need to do that. No, here's the, here's the way you do it. And this was part of Michael's, uh, Durham, uh, his, his like big point at the men's retreat. His big point was faith, believe God. How do you abide? You, you believe him. You believe what he says. You trust him. The, the way that you grow in love and unity here is not by doing. It's by really believing it's Christ in you, church. That you are the temple of God. That God does dwell here among you. It's believing him And you'll start seeing one another in a different light. And the doing comes naturally. Because John wrote in 1 John, we do his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome for us. What are his commandments? 
believe on the Lord and love one another. That's the summation of Christ's teaching, love one another. It's not a burden to love the people that God loves. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that you are here. Lord, I, I, I just I pray for this church. Lord, thank you for them and just pray that you would continue the work that you have begun, Lord, and that you would continue growing them and increasing them. Lord, that you would bless them with just an ever-increasing measure of unity and love for one another, being of the same mind and one purpose. Lord, and that you would just uh, give them corporately, Lord, just... Uh, Lord, just a, a more real realization of the fact that, that you are here among them. Lord, that they would fix their eyes on you all the more resolutely. In Jesus' name, amen.